Good morning. Today is May 17th, and this is our worship service from Elders Baptist Church. We apologize for not being able to use the Zoom uh, meeting to broadcast it, but apparently they're having problems all over the world. A couple things I want to share with you before Mitch sings, and then I'll preach after he sings. Um, if you want to be part of my Sunday night Bible study, I need to hear from you today by about three o'clock. Now the meeting or the Bible study is supposed to be with, on Zoom and we're going to just have to see if that works, um, but I still need to hear from you if you have not already communicated with me that you want to be part of our uh, Bible study tonight. Second thing is after I'm done preaching, I'm going to share with the congregation uh, some information about uh, ongoing worship services here at Elders. As most of you know, we are in Governor Hogan's phase one of restarting the economy, and I'm going to share with you how that applies to our church and what our plans are. So um, when I'm done preaching, don't hang up yet. Uh, we're not done. Brother Mitch, come, come sing for us. Here we go. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world. Though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith is caught the joyful sound. The song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. All right. Thank you, Mitch. I do hope you have a copy of God's Word with you, and we're going to be reading um, from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. And here's what the text says for us this morning. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles, so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. On July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were the first men to land on the moon. I can remember watching the broadcast on TV from our house in Littleton, Colorado with my family. When Armstrong descended down the ladder and took that first step onto the lunar soil, there was an estimated 650 million people watching on television around the world. And everyone watched Neil Armstrong um, take that first step and, and say those words that we all remember. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. For two and a half hours, Armstrong and Aldrin um, walked on the moon, they set up science experiments, they planted the American flag, they collected rock and soil samples, uh, they took pictures, they even took a phone call from President Nixon. Um, but about two weeks earlier, the two astronauts did not draw the same kind of numbers. In fact, the world wasn't all that terribly interested in what was happening two weeks before the lunar landing. What was different? Well, obviously it was the location. The two men were broadcasting from the moon. They were doing something that had never been done before. Uh, they were making history. They were completing the, the challenge that President Kennedy had given to our nation of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. 
But I suggest to you this morning that there was more going on than just the historic, historical nature of the moon landing. I think the world was interested in the history of it, but they were also interested in the fact that it was strange. It was unusual. No one had ever done what these two men were doing. So people were interested in what would happen. People wanted to see how it was done. They wanted to see the two astronauts in their spacesuits. They wanted to, to see them walking on the moon. How would that be different than walking here on Earth? What was it like to be in a place that had no atmosphere? And I suspect there were probably some people watching to see what would happen if one of the astronauts got themselves into some trouble. Well, I want to suggest to you this morning that the same thing's happening today. The people of this world that do not follow the Lord Jesus Christ are watching us. They want to know what happens when you and I fall, what Christians call sin. Will we start following Jesus again? Will Jesus even take us back if we sin? They want to know what's happening, you know, what goes on. The world's watching us. Well, our text this morning uh, deals with a new segment of Peter's address. Um, in verse 11, he starts a, a new section that will run through the middle of chapter 4, and it focuses primarily on the Christian's responsibility to an unbelieving world. And the section that we have before us this morning uh, deals with how do we live our life in front of non-Christians. It's kind of a summation of the rest of the section of Peter's letter. And to help us set the stage for this section, I want to begin this morning by focusing on the world that we live in, the battle that we are fighting, and the witness that we are sharing. One of the subtle lies that the demonic world wants us to believe is that there's really not that much difference between this world in the kingdom of God. Or to put it another way, it's okay for a Christian to love the world and to love Jesus. But I don't want you to fall for that lie because the apostle John was very, very clear when he wrote in 1 John 2.15 these words, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So this morning, I want us to begin by thinking about the world that we live in for just a few minutes. Allow me to make an analogy between the moon landings and the life of Christians. We are those astronauts. We are walking and living in an alien world. Like Armstrong and Aldrin, we have to be careful that we don't get ourselves into trouble by the mistakes that we make, what we call as Christians, sin. Prior to the Apollo moon landings, the astronauts worked hard to understand the strange environment of the, of the moon and of space. And Christians need to understand the environment that we live in, the world that is around us. And here's a couple of things I want us to keep in mind. First of all, the world is rejecting God, whereas we Christians are worshiping God. This idea of rejecting goes back to our old nature, that sin nature in us. We would rather run from God than run to God. And so don't be surprised when your lost friends don't want to come to church. And we need to invite them. We need to encourage them to come and be a part of a church family. But the world is rejecting God instead of worshiping him. The world is also... Um, Worshiping, or excuse me, seeking salvation through works versus by grace. Christianity is the only religion in the world that has a grace based salvation. We are saved not by works, but by God's grace. But if you look at all the other religions of the world Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, the list goes on and on and on. Everything else is works based. It's dependent upon the worshiper to be able to please their idea of God, to keep their commandments. And um, the ability to do so is 
impossible because we know that salvation does not come by works. The world is also delighting in sin, whereas we Christians are supposed to delight in holiness. Just turn on the TV and watch a sitcom. Uh, look at the evening news. You're going to see people celebrating their sin. Uh, this is what the world does because they don't know any better. And they're trying to convince themselves that their sinfulness is okay. You and I as Christians are to celebrate holiness. Uh, there's nothing holy in us as Christians except Jesus Christ. But we celebrate that relationship that God has declared us holy. Even though we're still sinners, God has made us holy in Jesus Christ. Something else the world's doing is that it's a lover of self, whereas we Christians are supposed to have unconditional love for others. The world looks out only for themselves. Um, heard a story of a um, little ruckus between a couple of people in a, re in a um, business because somebody cut in line and instead of waiting their turn. And somebody didn't like that. You know, people are just interested in themselves. But what did Jesus say is the second half of the greatest commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's an agape love, an unconditional love. This is the way that we Christians are supposed to behave towards others. The world is also um, reckless in their lives, whereas we Christians are supposed to live disciplined lives. Now, when I say reckless, I'm obviously not talking about everybody, but look at how a lot of people live their lives, chasing drugs or chasing alcohol or chasing um, extramarital sex or chasing uh, gambling. They're, they're living reckless lives. They don't care about the future even next week. They're only interested in the here and the now. And we Christians should not be that way. We should live disciplined lives that bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then one last thing about the world, the world is living for the present, whereas the church is supposed to be living for eternity. Um, the, the lost world around us, they don't care what happens next week, next month, next year. They have no concept of eternity. But we Christians shouldn't be thinking so much about the present as about the future. We'll... Um, what will Jesus say to us when we enter into glory? Will he greet us with those precious words, well done, my good and faithful friend? Or will we have some explaining to do because we didn't exactly live the way we were supposed to? You see, the challenge for Christians is how to live in this world so that um, that is so opposite or so opposed to the God that we love. I think the first step that we've got to do is we've got to acknowledge the differences. The world is very different than the kingdom of God that we live in now. Um, we have to remember to whom we belong, and it's God. Um, it's easy for us as Christians to slide back into that old sin habit, that sin nature. Um, but if we remember that the world only offers temporary satisfaction, but God offers eternal peace. We need to remember that um, the world offers temporary happiness, whereas God offers unceasing joy. There's a lot of things the world offers, and I'll be honest, they're, they're positive, but they do not compare at all with what God offers. And if we'll remember that, I think we'll have an easier time um, living in uh, this world. Um, I want us to now get back to our text, verses 11 and 12, and I want to read those verses once more. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. Now from our text, I want you to see the battle that we are fighting. On the British sector of uh, Sword Beach on June the 6th, 1944, uh, the invasion of Normandy was going pretty well for the British. Um, they were making slow but steady progress. They had gotten off of the beaches. They were beginning to advance in the open fields. And 
German resistance was heavy in some areas and lighter in others. But then something happened that's one of those stranger than fiction stories that could only happen um, in wartime. You see, the British were on one side of the field fighting, and the Germans were on another side of the field fighting back, and a French woman walked out into the field and began to pick up chicken eggs. This is something she had done every day of her adult life, probably. And the British stopped firing. The Germans stopped firing. Both sides looked in amazement at what this British or this French woman was doing. She was walking around, leaning over, picking up chicken eggs. And when she filled up her basket, she headed back to her, her home. And within a few minutes, the British and the Germans were again fighting each other. Now, it's an absolutely true story, by the way. And a lot of Christians are like that French woman. We are in a battle, but we don't seem to notice or care. We want to know that the battle, is, or God wants us to know that the battle is quite real. Peter offers us three ways that the battle is being fought all around us. And the first thing he says is this, that we are living as strangers and exiles. There's a war going on around us, but we are... Uh, we are participating in that war as strangers. We are not of this world. We are different. We are beyond. We are outside. We are of God's kingdom. And so we are strangers in this land. We are exiles, if you will. And we've got to live that way. Instead of coming into the land and living like the world lives and, and with all of its sinfulness, we have to live according to the kingdom of God. Peter also tells us that Christians should abstain from sinful desires that war against the soul. This word abstain is a commandment. We are commanded by God to abstain, to have nothing to do with sinful desires. Now, obviously, sin still is a part of this world, but we should not pursue it. We should not seek it out. We should do everything that we can to, as Peter says, abstain from it. Um, then Peter says this, if there is any doubt of, about us being in a battle, I want you to see a particular word that he uses in verse 11. He uses the word war, for we are in a war that we fight. Now, you can be like that French woman and pretend nothing's happening. You can go about your merry little way picking up your, your chicken eggs, but there's a war happening. And we Christians have to learn how to fight it in God's terms. Amen. This battle is not fought with guns and hand grenades and tanks and so on. It's fought on our knees. It's fought through the authority of the word of God. And we've got to spend our time fighting God's way. All right. When Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, the battle was over with. It was done. Now, a soldier is going to fight differently if he knows the war has already been won than if it's still being waged. And I want you as Christians to understand that we're on the winning side. Though, though we still have battles in this world to fight, God has won the victory and we're on the winning side if we are in Christ. Isn't that great? We ought to celebrate. Amen. All right. Don't ever forget that Jesus has won the battle for us. Let's read our text one more time because it deals with uh, th this idea of witnessing. 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12 says this, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. So we've now looked at the battle. Let's now look at the witness that we give. On the day of Jesus' ascension, he gathered his apostles and some of his disciples together outside of Jerusalem, and he was about to ascend up into heaven. And right before that happened, he spoke these words. You will be my witnesses, or excuse me, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. 
and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Please notice that Jesus did not say that we will be witnesses of his when we go knocking on doors or when we take an evangelism class. Now, it's certainly true that we are witnesses at those times, but we are witnesses always. We are witnesses of Jesus Christ when we're at work, when we are in our home, when we're grocery shopping, when we're taking a walk with the dogs, whatever it may be. We are always witnesses, and we need to understand that the world is watching us. Now, Peter gives us three things that he wants us to understand about being witnesses, and the first is this, that we are to conduct ourselves honorably. We need to live our lives in such a way that nobody can have cause to, to um, accuse us of being evil or doing what's wrong. Years ago, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was in his office um, in England, and two men came into his office. They wanted Spurgeon to do something um, in the community that he was opposed to, and they threatened to, to li uh, lie about him. They threatened to, to ruin his character. They threatened to spread all sorts of gossip about him. And you know what Spurgeon said? Go ahead because he understood that he had lived his life to the glory of God and the world would not listen to the lies that these two men were talking about. That's what we have to do. We have to live our lives in such honorable fashion that nobody will have cause to uh, bring a charge against us. Second th thing Peter wants us to know is that we are being watched, and that is certainly true. Whenever your family, your, fr your friends, your co-workers, your classmates, whenever they hear that you are a follower of Jesus, trust me, friends, you're marked. They're going to watch to see how you fall. They're going to watch to see how you handle problems. They're going to watch to see if you um, do something that they um, think Christians shouldn't be doing. You're marked. And we just got to realize that that's part of being a, a witness, that people are watching us. Uh, for better or for worse. Then third, Peter wants us to understand that we are to live so that God is glorified. All right. That idea of on the day that uh, God visits, that's not referring to the um, second coming or the rapture. I think that that's re or referring to the fact that God visits upon his people all the time. Today, we have the Holy Spirit that lives in us. And the point is this, is that we should live our life in such a way that the world brings glory to God. Now imagine those people who reject God, who don't like God, who would rather run from God, they see your life, they see my life, and they have no other option but to give honor and glory to God. That's how we ought to be living our life. That is the way that we are to be witnesses of, to God. You know, God has given every Christian the tools to be successful in our witness. He has given us our Holy Spirit. He has given us the Bible. He has given us the promise of heaven. He's given us forgiveness. We could go on and on and on. The point is this, that if we will simply walk the Christian walk, we should if we're willing to live the way Christ wants us to live, then God will be honored. God will be glorified in us. And people will see Christ in us through the way that we live our life. You know, when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins completed their um, journey to the moon and back, the world celebrated. Um, after they got out of their 21-day quarantine, uh, there were parades all over the world. They attended state dinners in nation after nation. Uh, they were received awards and, of course, lots of congratulations and pats on the back. When you and I complete our journey here on earth, we're going to enter into the glories of heaven. And I don't know if there's going to be a, a parade up there in heaven or not, but I know there's going to be a huge feast. The Bible tells us that. Uh, we will meet again with our family and our friends who have gone before us in the Lord. Um, and there's going to be a lot of celebration. But one thing I hope I hear, and I hope that you're working towards also, is when I see Jesus for the very first time, I pray that he greets me with these words. Well done, my good and faithful friend. 
enter into your Lord's joy. Friends, I want you to understand that we're living in a world that is different from the kingdom of God. We are not to be like the world. We are to be um, committed to Christ. We are in a battle, and we've got to fight this battle God's way. And we also are witnesses. Not that we will be, but we are witnesses. And I pray that you will think about what Peter says in this passage, and you will commit yourself to serving God to his glory. Mitch is going to come up here and sing one more time. And as he sings, I want you to think about something that I've said. Maybe God has spoken to you. I pray that he has and that you would respond to what he's telling you to do. When Mitch um, con uh, concludes his song, I've got some more words to share with you. So don't go away. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And this past Friday evening at five o'clock, uh, the state of Maryland entered into the first of Governor Hogan's planned uh, three-phase strategy for restarting the economy. And I want to share with you some of the things that they are asking us to do as a church and make a, a couple of comments. First of all, under stage one, the wearing of face masks will continue, okay? Um, whether we meet here in the worship center or outside, uh, doesn't matter, you're gonna be required to wear a face mask. Um, one of the issues that we're gonna have to talk about at the church council uh, meeting, which is scheduled for 12.30 this afternoon, is the taking of people's temperatures. What the state and the county is recommending is that people's temperatures be taken before they enter the building or at least before they leave the house. Um, we're gonna have to talk about how we want to deal with that, uh, that issue. They are recommending a seven foot social distancing um, uh, gap be uh, uh, maintained between families. Now, obviously, families can sit together, whether it be in the worship center or outside, we can sit together as families, but from family to family, there's supposed to be a seven foot um, gap in, um, in between the families. Then how do we sanitize our building, um, especially uh, the chairs that we sit in or the restrooms that we use? Um, the, the county and the state are recommending that um, surface contacts be sanitized both before and after uh, worship services. So we're going to have to figure out how we're going to do that. And that's something we're going to talk about in the church council meeting. One last thing that I want to share with you um, from the, the governor's office, and it's also from the county office, and it's this. Both are recommending the refraining from congregational singing. And those are the exact words that I'm reading from their um, website. Churches should refrain from congregational singing. Friends, I want you to understand something as your pastor. The government has the authority to tell us we can't meet in the church house. So we meet on Zoom or through YouTube or in some other way. The government can tell us to wear face masks. We put on face masks. The government can tell us to have social distancing, and we practice that. Um, 
but as your Baptist pastor, I believe very strongly that the government does not have the right, does not have the authority to tell us how we worship. Singing has been a part of Christian worship since the, the days of Jesus. I would remind you that right before Jesus and his apostles left the upper room, they sang a hymn. Singing is part of our faith because of the joy that we have in Christ. And I want, you, the, I want our church to know Elders Baptist Church will continue to sing in our worship services. Now, if you feel that that is going to um, endanger you, then I encourage you to stay home. Um, but we will continue to sing. Who should come to the church house? Well, it might be easier to say who should stay home instead. If you are a senior adult, if you are medically fragile in any way, uh, you need to stay home. One of the biggest challenges that we're going to have in the next few months is how do we take care of our children? It's next to impossible to ask children to social distance. And a lot of them aren't going to want to wear the masks as well. So for the time being, we're not going to be offering any children's activities here at the church. Um, parents need to plan accordingly. If you can keep your children busy um, sitting with you, that's fine. Bring them. We'd love to see them. We want to, to love everybody. Um, but we're not, as a congregation, going to be able to take care of your children and follow the government guidelines. Um, where are we going to meet next Sunday? Will we be on Zoom again? Hopefully. <laughs> Will we be recording it and posting it on YouTube? Will we be meeting outside? Uh, will we be meeting indoors? This is stuff, things that the church council is going to have to talk about. Your church staff is ready to, to meet um, as a congregation together in person right now. Um, but we've got some issues that we need to talk about. And so I want you to pray for your staff, pray for your church council. And as we make some decisions, we will certainly um, pass the word on to you. I want you to understand this more than anything else of what I've just said. Our goal is to keep you healthy. We want to take care of our, our church family. So um, we're going to be taking extra steps in order to uh, make sure that our bathrooms are clean and our worship centers are clean and classrooms are clean and um, these sort of things. But we, you need to do your part as well. If you're not feeling good, if you got a little sniffle, if you uh, maybe have a little bit of a headache, if maybe have a little tickle in your chest, stay home. I'd much rather you stay home one Sunday um, and come back the next. That's okay. God certainly understands those things. We will continue to post our services online, even if we do start meeting outside or in the worship center. But you need to do your part as well. And if you are one of the senior adults in our church or a med medically fragile person, please stay home. We look forward to ministering to you and we look forward to seeing you in the future but we want you to stay well. You've probably heard by now that one of our church members has been diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, I pray that that will be the last person in our church with it. Uh, we wanna pray for Nancy and Bill. We wanna lift them up to the Lord and uh, call on his graces to be strong on Bill even today. And towards that end, I wanna close with a word of prayer. Father, you are the God who heals. You know all of our problems. You know um, what's going on in our thoughts. You know every word before it comes out of our mouth. You know what's going to happen tomorrow and if Christ tarries 10,000 years from now. Lord, we pray that you would guide the doctors and nurses taking care of Bill. And Lord, if it be your will, as we pray it is, that you would bring healing to him. And this, let this time of separation between Bill and Nancy go by quickly so that they can be reunited together again. Father, I lift up Nancy and I pray that you would just love on her and just hug her and, and, and remind her constantly 
that your grace is sufficient for both her and Bill. Father, we look forward to that day when there will be no more suffering, no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more death. But until it does, Lord, until that day comes, help us to walk in your strength. Help us to take care of ourselves, but also to take care of others. And may you be honored and glorified in your church always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, folks. Have a great day.